most of the content of this topic is quite uh, boring with a lot of uh, trivial details, but be patient, a lot of fun. Uh, the first, what is Bcash? Uh, Bcash, Bcash is a Linux kernel block layer cache. And uh, for example, there is the backend device. Normally it's a hard drive. And uh, here we have uh, SSD and we accelerate uh, the IO by a random uh, accessible uh, SSD. And here is the Bcache device. Bcache device is the GenDisk interface to be accessed from a user space. Uh, if, uh, it can be attached to uh, SSD, and also it can be accessed directly without SSD. Uh, if the backend device is detached, so the, the access to the Bcache device uh, just the same to access to the backend hard drive. And if uh, the backend device is attached to the SSD, so all the random I/O will be cached in the SSD. Yeah. And here is the, here, here's the, this one is special. We call that a flash only volume. That, that's something like uh, to share the space of the SSD with some pure random storage. Yeah. We, we, we won't uh, talk about this. One. And uh, currently uh, for Bcache, we have uh, four cache models. The, the right back, right through, right around, and the none. So inside Bcache, when Bcache handling parallel, parallel IOs, majorly uh, th there are two kind of IOs. One is for metadata, one is for data. Uh, here is the example for the right back mode. So for right back mode, that is, uh, for random I/O, uh, even right back mode, data can still go into backend device directly if they are continuous and uh, bigger than four megabyte, uh, four megabyte, yeah. And for random I/O, the first uh, the B cache will try to store them on SSD, and then insert a key in the internal B tree to indicate that uh, this LB address is uh, cached. So the first uh, write data block on cache device. Cache device means SSD. That's a data IO. And insert a key into internal B plus tree. That is metadata IO. Uh, after both data IO and the metadata IO all completed, and then we uh, we complete the original BIO to indicate to the caller that uh, the, the I.O. is done. Uh, there is dependency. The dependency is uh, the metadata I.O. should start after data I.O. Uh, that makes sense. Otherwise, uh, if there is a power failure, we will encounter a stale point on the metadata. Yeah. Uh, this is the right back mode, and uh, okay. So here is the right through mode. For the B catch right through mode, it means that the data will go into the backend device, and the random data will also stay in SSD. So uh, we 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 can see that uh, for the right through mode. And on the SSD, we, we, we don't talk about the I.O. into the, the backend device, that's slow. We talk about the I.O. on the SSD. Uh, the first also, uh, write the data block on cache device, and then insert a key into internal B plus tree, and then complete the original B.I.O. Uh, but here, there is no dependency for metadata and the data. The, the IOs uh, can be issued in parallel, and just uh, the caller wait for all of them completed and are complete to the uh, upper layer. And uh, for the write around mode, the write around mode means uh, write will bypass the SSD, but the read 
can be cached in SSD. Uh, it, it makes sense, just uh, try to occupy uh, too much space on the SSD by the writing operations. And, but, but in this mode, there is something we need to uh, notice that if some data bypass the cache, go into the backing device directly, the big cache will make sure there won't be some stale data in the cache. So the big cache will invalidate the bypass data in the cache. That means check in the internal B plus tree if there is this same LB address hit in the B plus tree, just uh, invalidate the key. It's uh, indeed it's uh, quite similar to to write back or write around. The only difference is uh, for write back and uh, uh, for write back and write through mode, the B cache insert the tree into the B tree. For the write around mode, the B cache invalidate the key from the B tree. But invalidate also is kind of a metadata I/O, so that's no different. Please. Sorry. Yeah, what is your advantage of using write around mode versus write through or write back? Is it is it better for say read only type of data where writes are seldom and reads are more or mm, people just want to use that. <laughs> just want to use that avoid the uh, avoid the, the right random write to occupy the SSD. Maybe sometimes even the data is a random uh, the, after the written into the backing device and never read back. Just for such a situation. Yeah. So in this case, also there is no dependency between the metadata and the data. Just the caller need to make sure all of them completed and then return, return to the user space called the BIO and IO. But all this, kind of, all this kind of dependency should be handled very fast. The very fast means uh, need to avoid the latency as much as uh, they can. So later I will show the magic. That means that uh, the, so the difficulty to understand the Bcash code is when you read the code. When you read the code, the order you read the code is not the order the code is executed. Everything is in async method. Uh, some, there are quite a lot of callback and just a registered callback to a work queue. Even there is no work queue, the callback can also be async, yeah. And uh, another thing is, uh, when all the parallel IOs flying, in this moment, we can't remove the underlying devices. Otherwise, uh, the, the kernel will panic. Yeah, because uh, we, we need to maintain the reference counter to make sure all the objects in use should not be released. And they can only be released when there is no other object reference them. Yeah. And the, the, in, in the maybe last or maybe the last the second page, I will show how to dereference the dependency when the underlying device is failed. Yeah. So in kernel object reference counters, there also matters for the parallel I.O. That when I.O. is flying, all necessary kernel objects should not be released. Yeah. And when cache device and the backend device is filled, the all flying I.O. should be stopped or completed properly. Uh, before the kernel 417, if the underlying cache device is filled, or maybe the backend device is filled, the I.O. can continue to go. 
even the underlying uh, the layer report EIO, the Bcash code cannot handle it, and the whole Bcash device is in an undefined state. And all kernel objects should be released in an order of dependence. That means when we, when we release the resources, we, we, we can't release the resources being referenced. We, we need to find the, the, the object, no other one reference it, and just release it first. So in an order of dependency. That means uh, a kernel object can only be released when it is not referenced anymore. So right now, the, we, we, we touched the topic, Bcash closure. So what is a Bcash closure? Bcash closure is designed to handle such uh, conditions. So Bcash closure uh, is a framework, and indeed that when, when Kent originally wrote this code, he also tried to make this uh, to be a generic maker, uh, framework. I, I think the reason it is not for now is just uh, too flexible. Too flexible. Uh, Clura is a framework to synchronize dependent parallel I.O. with low latency and uh, less resources. And dependence of a parallel I.O. are represented by dependence hierarchy of uh, Reference counters. That means uh, if some I/O depends on other I/Os, then this I/O can be the parent of the reference counter of other I/O or resources. So when other I/O or resources completed and uh, their reference counter drop to zero, and uh, they execute their own callback their own callback for a DE constructor, and then they, call the, they, they drop the reference number of the parent counter, and if the parent counter reaches zero two, and the, the DE constructor of the parent counter is called. Uh, synchronization can be handled by kernel worker. And caller can be returned before IOs are completed. That means uh, the synchronization operation will happen, finally will happen somewhere, sometime, but the caller can return immediately to do something else. So the synchronization is handled in the async method. Yeah. Uh, okay. Right now, I, I just uh, I introduced the data structure design of uh, Bcash closure. Something funny. Here is the structure closure, and at the beginning, there's a union. Inside the union, they share the memory for two structures. One is a unnamed structure. One is a structure work structure. Uh, here is the work queue. This work queue is uh, it's used to store a point to real work queue and indicate if the callback function here want to be executed in async way, which work queue the Bcash code can schedule the key work onto. And here the list, the list means uh, if the resource is waiting for many objects, and every waiter can wait on the wait list. And here is the parent, Clara. The, the parent closure is uh, if the parent need to wait for some other I/O or resource to complete it, and then he can do his own cleanup or something else. Then this this. Object can be a parent, and uh, just a call the closure call or continue add to the children closure. And here, here is the reference count. But this reference count also has some uh, uh, extra text, but never mind. Just uh, for the most significant uh, bits, there are some text, but for the lower, uh, the, the less significant bits, that's uh, 
just counters. A tricky, a tricky is here. Here is the callback function point. But this symbol is only used to sign the address of the callback fun function. The bcash code never call the callback function by this symbol. It, it call it by the work.func here. So if you find where the, the work.func is assigned, you won't find it. The reason is uh, this one, you can see uh, here, this, this pointer exactly perfect overwrite with the work func point inside this structure. And they share same memory. So the code, you can only find that the pointer is, uh, is assigned a value to here and the reference to here. That's funny. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> and that's funny. Uh, how can I realize this? Because I find uh, somewhere else uh, there's, there's the build, on, uh, build bug on here to check the offset. Yeah, the func member inside the structure work structure should be exactly the same to the iPhone pointer inside the structure closure. Yeah. If not, there is an error reported in the build time. I think the motivation for such code is just to avoid a, an extra pointer copy, I think. Yeah. <laughs> it works, it works. <laughs> but, I mean, um, just, just for the sake of, our, of, of discussion, what would happen if we uh, just remove the union and have the struct directly there? Then surely the structure will become larger, but uh, uh, for now I just try to understand how it works. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I think this might uh, this might actually uh, this might be part of the issue that yeah. is causing the problem. Because if you have the structure that is Calm down. There are a lot of fun here. Oh. I will show you later. I will show you later. <laughs> Okay. Here is how the magic happens. Please look carefully. Here is a continue at, and here is a closure queue. The continue at, just from the name, continue at. That is uh, inside the continue at, the closure. Uh, minus one from the reference count. Yeah. Even you can see here is a plus one, but notice here is sub. So plus one means uh, minus one. If uh, they want to add one to the reference number, just uh, use minus one because here is sub. So minus one means plus one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, funny. <laughs> and here, uh, there's the work queue. If the work queue is a known pointer, so the callback function will be will be called immediately. If at this moment the continue add is called, the reference counter is zero, and the work queue is known, it will be called immediately. That's the that's a sync way. And for all other conditions, the callback function is queued in async way. And also, if, if someone wants to directly call the callback function, uh, the closure queue can be used. Here, if the work queue is, is known, so they just directly call this closure callback function, you, you can find out if the work queue is not known, he just uh, 
initial this work pointer and schedule it. So you can see, same, indeed, this one and this one, they are same thing. They are same thing because in the union, they share same, exactly the same function pointer. Yeah. And from the code, you can find that if there's a work queue, the, the callback will be executed async from the context from the, work, from the work queue. And even the work queue is known, but the reference counter is not known, not known here. The callback will still be registered, but not executed here. It will be executed somewhere else when the reference counter is zero in that context, not here. Yeah. This is how the, this is very, very major and a simple method, how continue, continue at work. Also, there's, there's something else like a closure sync. Closure sync is just a, a blocking operation to always wait all the closure, the current closure is finished. But I will not mention that here. I just show how the parallel I.O. and event is handled by the reference counter hierarchy. Ah. Uh, this is the example for the right back mode. How the closure is used to make sure the dependence is handled properly for the right back mode. Because for Redback mode, if Bcache decide to cache the data into SSD, the first they call this one, Chloro call, Chloro call, here is the callback, BCH data insert. That's insert data and the key into the SSD. And inside it, inside, inside it, inside this, this, this function, because this function will, uh, Initiate some chloro, for example, here. This one is a child chloro. The child chloro will be associated to this callback. And then here is the parent chloro. Parent chloro, you can see it here. Cache the dev write complete is continue on the parent chloro. So that means all the I.O. of the child chloro completed. And then the callback, this callback function will be called. Not here, the, not here. After the continue add, the code will return to the caller and uh, do something else. Yeah. Okay, let me show how it work. And this function called closure BIO submit to submit the BIO. The BIO is the data from the upper layer. So uh, this function just uh, write the data, write the data block to the cache. And, and after this function is called, that means uh, inside the, the, there is a generic make request, but do not wait. The BIO is completed, continue to call, continue add. And the callback is uh, BCH data insert key. This one is to insert the key into the internal P plus tree. So this operation and this operation, they are async call. They don't wait for each other. After the continue add returns, this continue add is called. But the difference is the closure. This one is child closure. This one is parent closure. So, they are all called and written immediately. And the code just fly as they want. The, the only thing to make them synchronize is just the reference counter. And as I, call, as I showed in the continue at the, the last page. And when this BIO completed, in the BIO in the IO callback, one reference count will be dropped. And for this operation finished, another 
reference count will be dropped. And the reference counter of the child closure will reach zero. And the oh yeah. Yeah, 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 I'm right. So when the reference counter reach zero, this one will be called. This is the callback function of the child closure. And when the child callback of the child closure finished, a counter of the parent closure will be dropped. And in this condition, the reference counter of the parent closure reach zero, and then the callback of this function will be called. Inside here, there's another BIO in the I.O., and uh, the BIO of the upper layer will be, the memory will be released here. Is it clear? Never mind, never mind. <laughs> uh, I just wonder whether there isn't some simpler way of expressing these dependencies, you know, because it's not exactly like this is very, how to say it, easy to see that, uh, like, yes. what, what depends on what, you know. It's yes, I agree with you, I agree with you. Especially when you read the code, they are all symbols CL. You need to remember which one is child, which one is parent. Otherwise, you're totally demolished. Yeah, exactly. It's just easy to get it wrong. Uh, Very know. easy. Uh, indeed, that I will. Uh, this uh, this is this is an example. I will show how to dereference the reference counter and uh, when the underlying device is filled. Uh, I will show it later. For this one, here to here is a single, and the, the, the rest, it, they are all async. Async means that before the I.O. is completed or the operation is completed, just return directly to the caller. And everything is scheduled to, to the work queue. Uh, but the, uh, the latest the, the work queue is a null, so the lab means it's a, a single line to call the cache. No, no. no. Null just means it's null. Uh, even it's null, the callback still be registered. And uh, the callback can be executed in, in other contexts where it is caught. Okay, so so even it's a new uh, work queue. Yeah, and if here here is a work queue, that means yeah. in that someone else inside that context, the caller can still schedule the callback to a work queue. Okay. Okay, this is how the, the I.O. dependence is handled in the right back mode. Here's the right through and the right around mode. Uh, because I, I treat the, the insert the key and the invalid the key, just the, the I.O. on the internal B tree. I, I treat them the same one. Okay. The first call Clover BIO submit to submit a BIO to the backend device, and then call Clover call to insert the data into the SSD. It, that means uh, and uh, insert data. And uh, inside the, the BCH underscore data underscore insert, there is another Clover BIO submit to write to write the BIO, this BIO, same one, to write data on the SSD. If, if that's invalidated, 
the, the length will be zero. No, length still not zero. Just the key the value. Uh, the, the key value is minus. That means uh, invalidate here. This operation is to insert the key or invalidate the key from the internal B tree. And after all of this is done, call continue at here. And this callback, cached, def, read, complete, will be called somewhere else. When all the previous references are done. The first, uh, this one, closure BL submit will set, will, will get a reference count and uh, call the BIO. And before this BIO to the backend device is completed before that, just immediately call closure call to insert the data. And in, inside this function, because it's a closure call, so just call immediately. That's the synchronized call. Just call closure BIO submit to write the data block on the SSD. And before the IO completed, immediately call continue at. This one is to insert the key into B tree because it is continue at. Just the return immediately and the call continue at. Cached, dev, write complete. The difference is here we need we need to be very clear that the difference is the closure. I, I just added the indent to indicate that the closure here is for child closure, and the closure here is for parent closure. So the callback of the parent closure can be executed when all his children closures finished. So here is the Synchronize, synchronization point. But when and where the callback executed depends on which child closure lastly drop the reference count to zero. So that means uh, the order we read the code is not the order how the code is executed. Any question? So it's clear, I think. <laughs> okay. Okay. Here is uh, another important usage for the Bcache closure to make sure that all the necessary object won't be released when someone is referenced it. The example is uh, here is the virtual bcache device. Here is the real cache device. Cache device means the backend device. The cache device is just the conceived inside the, the bcache code. The here is the cache set. Cache set means SSD. Still, cache set is uh, the conceived inside bcache code. And to make sure the cache set won't be dropped when there is I.O. flying, a chloro get is called to get a reference count from the C, C is current cache set, to, 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 to get a reference count for the caching, a chloro named caching. Uh, that's okay, you don't need to remember that. I, I just uh, say you just hear, that's okay. And uh, for the cached device, a cached dev get is called to get a reference count for the cached device. And when the reference count of cached device, cached device, a, a cached device reached zero, a reference count of uh, the closure caching will be dropped. It's quite uh, implicit. I, I think at least two, two or one or two function calls, and you can find the dependency. And uh, for, for the cached device and the, the cached device, they use uh, cached dev get to get a reference count to, to, to occupy each other. 
And uh, there are many kernel thread or kernel worker running. Uh, and uh, we need to make sure before they stopped, the memory object won't be released. So there is a journal discard work to discard the SSD space. And then there is a journal write work, key worker to, to write, to, to, to write uh, the metadata to journal. And there is a metadata IO work just do, uh, for example, uh, for Bcache, only the leaf node go into the journal. For the internal node, uh, they, they won't go into the journal. For the metadata IO, do things like this. And uh, there is a garbage collection thread. Garbage, garbage collection thread just to find uh, the, the, the bucket. If there is no one use this bucket, so market is rec reclaimable. Uh, and there is allocator thread. Allocator thread to, to, to if the current bucket is full, just to try to find other free available bucket for following write. And uh, this key work and the threads should reference the cache site. And this one, write back thread, that's write the dirty data back to the backing device. Uh, this key thread referenced both the cache site and the cache device because it read the data from SSD and uh, write it into the backing device. And uh, this one is the status update thread to monitor whether the SSD and, or the hard drive is still living. And here is the write back read update key worker. This key worker, uh, because uh, the, the write back thread, there is the PI controller control the write back throughput and the front I.O. throughput. So it's uh, self-adapted. So there is the key work to dynamically calculate the write back rate every five or seven, every five seconds, I remember. So these three things, they will reference both here and here. That means if the underlying device is, is failed, we, can, we, we can't simply remove the gen disk structure. We need to dereference all the reference counter carefully to make sure everything stopped properly. Otherwise, uh, there is a kernel panic. Uh, I will show an example later that if one of the devices failed, how to handle the reference counter. Okay, now we look at the performance. Uh, the different, uh, here I find a third part benchmark data from a internet, someone called Andy, Andy Smith. Uh, posted the benchmark data on his blog. Uh, I just uh, copy that and uh, cite his work here. Uh, he does a comparison between Bcache and uh, LVM cache. Indeed, that in kernel, that's DM cache. For in generally, Bcache is the performance is better than DM cache, but for for writing. For writing, it seems like uh, DM cache is better. Yeah. You can see that the, here. Here is, uh, here, is uh, uh, the, here is the grip, git grip. So the, 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 the number lower is better. Here, uh, the B cache, it, the latency is smaller than the DM cache. And this one is uh, git clone, Linux stable tree. So uh, you can see that. LVM cache is better. But for the rest of the benchmark test, for this one, this one is a git grip, git grip something. Uh, here is uh, the number for LVM cache, and here is the number for B cache. B cache is always faster and uh, quite stable. The number is quite stable. And here, here is the, the comparison, the latency comparison for LVM cache and the B cache. This, this line 
is for LVM cache, and this line is for B cache. Yeah. So, in general, the latency of B cache it's recognized smaller than LVM cache. One of the major reasons is the design of uh, the reference hierarchy. That's uh, that's B cache color. So, although the B cache color is complicated, it is worthy to use it because the better performance. Yeah. But don't get me wrong that uh, because both LVM cache and uh, B cache are supported by us. Yeah. So. Personally, I don't have point for the performance difference between these two cache because if there is bug, or report it to me. Okay. The last one. This is a real example from our partner that uh, Lenovo, Lenovo uh, when they run their Subhana solution, they found that if the SSD, the cache device, is failed, data will continue to go into backend device. So that means the dirty data is ignored and the backend device is corrupted because the, 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 the latest status is on cache, but the, the B cache ignored the lost data cache, so the backend device is corrupted. Another thing is uh, the backend device is gone. But the Bcache code continue in the write back mode. Bcache code continue to write the data into cache, and only find that the backend device is gone when the cache start to run the write back, and uh, there are a lot of uh, I/O error reported. So the at this moment, maybe a lot of data will be lost it because the backend device is gone for quite a long time. So they require us to, to provide a method to detect whether the, the device is, is gone. If the device is gone, we will do something called a conditional stop B cache device. What's that? That is, if the SSD is failed, but the data on SSD is clean. We can continue make the B cache device to work, just ignore the, the cache device. That means even the performance is really bad, but the people can still access the data. And if the cache is dirty and the cache is gone, we need to immediately stop the B cache device and prevent the users from uh, following access because the the following write may make the data corrupted. Okay, I'll start to tell the details of this picture. The first, SSD is gone. The, the condition is SSD is gone. And how can we stop the SSD and the backend device properly? When SSD is, is gone and uh, their I.O. continue coming and they'll reach a threshold of the IO error, the function catch set error will be called. And catch set error will call the B cache, uh, catch set stop. And catch set stop will synchronize call the callback function registered for the caching closure. The caching closure is uh, is associated to the to the cache inside the cache set. And here, the callback function is uh, underscore underscore cache set and register. I, I use this to indicate that uh, this callback is registered to this closure by the set uh, closure function function. Yeah. But here, inside this function. A continue at is called. That means when the caching closure, the reference number of the caching closure reaches zero, this this function will be called the set 
cache set flash. And for, for the old bcache code, this function is, is never caught. It's never caught. Why? Because the write back thread. The write back thread, when the dirty data beyond the threshold of the write back percent, the write back thread will write the dirty data back to the back of this device that 4K byte every second. So that's very slow. And the write back thread will never stop. And the write back thread hold a reference count. I don't, I don't have time. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so I add a flag, indicate that the write back thread should be stopped, and I drop the reference count. So the write back thread drop the reference count of the cached device. And uh, there's call trees. Finally, he called the chloral put for the caching chloral. This is the last reference count of the chloral caching. And then there is a chance to call the cache set flush. And inside the cache set flush, uh, because the this is the, the, the last the, the callback function of the child chloral. And then in turn the callback of the parent chloral is called. That is a catch set free. And the catch set reference is freed. And in the catch set and register, this conditional stop B cache device function is called. So one by one, one by one. Finally, they call the, uh, it's continued at uh, the chloral. This chloral is the disk chloral. That's the chloral associated to the bcache device. And when all the I.O. finished on the bcache device, the callback cache the dev free is called. And then all the resource and the memory uh, thread key work will be stopped and released here. And then all the resource is released we can stop the bcache device. Uh, for this fix, the major, the major fix to, to release the device only three patches. And I think uh, there are quite a lot of patches just to fix the kernel panic when I, when I, when I fix the dead, deadlock here. And uh, so I, I think the code before, the code is never tested. Because there is a deadlock, they never uh, run into the release code path. Okay, conclude. People will realize Bcache Clora is very convenient to use if uh, they understand it well. And uh, avoided block caller requester may help overall performance. Why? Because more requests can be generated. And carefully design the Clora dependent hierarchy allow IOs flying without extra delay, delay, then the better performance can be expected. Thanks for all your passion. <laughs> That's all. Any question? That's okay. That's okay. Just the drop. Indeed, that you just drop box to me. Yeah. Thank you all.